So today we're going to be talking about smart objects. I'm just going to get right to it because I get a lot of questions about smart objects and I want to jump in because I've got a lot of things that I need to talk about and analyze when it comes to smart objects. Inevitably, every single time I do a video in Adobe Camera Raw, uh, I get the question, Blake, when you open this in Photoshop, do you open it as a smart object so you can go back and edit these things later? And my typical answer is no, because I don't like smart objects for that reason. So what I'm going to talk about today are the two reasons why I do not like smart objects and the two reasons why I do like smart objects. Now, if you're wondering what a smart object is, it's basically a way to preserve the data of any layer or even a raw file as it's coming into Photoshop. And I'll talk about those things uh, as I show you these demonstrations. But let's just look at this photograph right here. You can see that when I'm doing all the work on my images, I put quite a bit of effort into my layered work here in Photoshop to get my end results that you see here. Now, this image, as you can see, it's just a background layer. It is not a smart object. If it was a smart object, it would have a little square right here that I could open up. So the question that comes in is, Blake, when you open up a raw file, why don't you open it as a smart object? Well, let's just go ahead and hypothetically talk about that. Okay, So I'm going to go ahead and just open up the raw image for this. I'm just going to double click it. I've got it on my other screen. So I'm double clicking this raw file, which will open it right into Adobe Camera Raw. That's just right from my Windows Explorer. So I'm in Adobe Camera Raw. And what Adobe Camera Raw allows you to do when you open an image as a smart object is it gives you the ability to go back and edit any of those raw settings at any time during your workflow, which hypothetically sounds awesome. But there are some drawbacks and we'll talk about that. So here is the raw image that we have. I, I just the exact raw settings I used to make that image, the PSD file that you just saw. So I'm going to press and hold shift. And when I press and hold shift, you're going to see it goes from open down here to open object. So I'm going to go ahead and open this as an object. You can also click this down arrow here next to open and say open as object. Now, when it opens as an object, it's opening as a smart object. And you'll know that because there's a little, little tearaway page right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag and drop this image right into this image right above the actual background work. Now that will simulate me actually starting this whole workflow as a smart object. So we talked about how working with smart objects can be advantageous because we can always go back to those raw settings, right? So you see all this layered work that's above this raw file, right? What if I say to myself, well, you know, maybe I need to brighten this up a little bit right here, uh, somewhere in the middle, maybe brighten up my shadows. I'm going to double click this which will allow me to go back into those raw settings. Now we aren't using Adobe Camera Raw as a filter. We're actually going back into the raw settings. So I said, okay, what I want to do here is just brighten this up a little bit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and increase the exposure, maybe take away some of that magenta too. And then um, maybe my shadows are already as high as they can go. Maybe increase my whites a little bit to brighten this image up. Now what you see here is the raw data. You do not see all of the layers above and what I did. So when I say, okay, and open this, all those layers above are still going to do all the things that they were doing on top of that image to begin with. Right. And it doesn't look any better. As a matter of fact, it probably looks worse. So I'm going to go back into my history palette here and just go back a little bit. So there's a reason why I don't like smart objects when it comes to this type of workflow, where we can go back to our raw settings. I don't think it's advantageous. And the reason why is because I can't read minds and I can't predict what's going to happen after all the layered work that I did above it. So what you're better off doing is actually working in your layers by using curves or levels or something else other than going back into that raw data to make that one area look better. Now, the only thing that I think that could possibly be good for is maybe some noise reduction if you want to go back in and do some more heavy noise reduction, but that's about it. Otherwise, it's almost useless. The second reason, and this is a quick one, why I don't like smart objects is they make your PSD files much, much bigger. Now, there have been times where I've done a layered workflow with no smart objects in it, and I might have about a one gig file from some of these bigger Sony sensors. But if I put two, maybe three smart objects in there, I might get to a two gig warning where it says, hey, we can't save this as a PSD. So in some cases, it can almost double the file size of your PSD work. 
there are two reasons why I do like smart objects. And that typically comes with a compositing type of workflow. I do a lot of composites when I make my family Christmas card every year and I use smart objects extensively during that process. And I'll give you an idea of what I'm talking about in this example image. Now I've already separated her from her background here, made it slight modifications with some curves adjustment layers on here. But what I want to do is I want to put this behind her because she looks like she's pretty smart and she knows how to use smart objects. So we're going to allow her to do that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this layer and I'm going to put it behind that separation. So to do that, I'm just going to press V for my move tool, click on this, press and hold shift so that it will align and then just add it here when I see that little plus sign. Now it's going to be right on top of the image. I'm going to put it in between them. So what you'll realize here is that this image, if we look at the image size, is 5,472 pixels on the width. This image, if we go to image size that we put it onto, is 4,000. So what that's telling me is that this image that we put on the background is already bigger than the image that we've put it into. So when we press Command or Control T and Control Zero, you can see just how much bigger this is. Now, typically the average person might say, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and resize this right now. Well, if we resize this, let's just do that hypothetically speaking, we resize this down to about just like this. This is for example purposes only. If I resize this down like this, okay, and then I commit to that and I try to press Command or Control T and make it larger again, you see we're gonna get some pixelation here. It's not retaining the data from the original image that we had placed on here to begin with. That's where smart objects are really powerful. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click on this and I'm gonna say convert to smart object. Once I convert this to a smart object, when I press Command or Control T to resize this, it's going to retain all of the data that was in there to begin with. So if I make this really small, just like you see here, and then press Command or Control T after I commit to that again to make it larger, you'll notice that we didn't lose any of that data. Now, that's really important when it comes to maybe resizing her. So I'm going to right click and say convert to smart object on this separated from background layer. If I press Command or Control T to make her smaller because she might be taking up too much space on here and then move her over here because I might want to put a thought bubble over here or something like that. If I commit to this, I have now shrunk those pixels down. But because it's a smart object, if I press Command or Control T and make her larger, all right, I don't lose that data. I get it all back. That's the first reason why I like smart objects, because when I'm doing composite work and I haven't really made up my mind as to what I want to commit to, I can experiment and not lose any data in the process. The second reason why I really like smart objects is also with composite work or any work where I'm using filters. So let's say I've got this set up the way I want it to be, but I want to make it look like she's more in focus than the background. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to filter. I'm going to go to blur and I'm going to go to Gaussian blur and I'm going to Gaussian blurs this and I'm going to say, okay, that looks really good. Oh, right there. But no, it doesn't <laughs> because I went overly aggressive with it. Now, you know that if this wasn't a smart object, we could just go back into our history palette. But because it's a smart object, you're going to see down here that not only does it have this little tearaway sheet now, it also has this thing that says Gaussian blur here. So I can double click on this Gaussian blur. And I, I said, wait, Blake, you went way too aggressive with that. Let's pull this down a little bit. OK, like that. And then we'll press OK. Uh, what that allowed me to do is go back into that Gaussian blur adjustment. It remembered the settings that was there and the original data that was there before so I could get it all back. The other cool thing about that, this is the kind of all tied together with the second reason why I like this. It's actually called smart filters is that we have a mask, an individual mask here just for that Gaussian blur. So if I press B for my brush tool and I switch to black, I can paint away in the back here of where the Gaussian blur is actually going to affect. So now, just to show you how that effect works, if I double click on the Gaussian blur and make this really strong, you can see that the data that's behind her because of that mask is staying uh, the way it should be and we're Gaussian blurring just that border that we created there. Now, would I do that for this uh, composite? Probably not, but I get, I get options. Smart objects give me options, but just know that if you were going to save this as a PSD file, because we have two smart objects here, this is going to be a big file. So what I would do in my compositing process is save that one big file. But as I'm working on things, maybe I'd want to convert these back to regular layers. And to do that, you would right click and say rasterize layer and then right click on this one and say rasterize layer. And now they've been converted from smart objects to the original 
dumb objects. So if you like this tutorial and you want to learn more about Photoshop, I've got this playlist right here, all about interesting Photoshop tips and tricks that can help you out in your workflow. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. I really enjoy making tutorials like this that take difficult topics in Photoshop, make them relatively easy to understand so that you can use them in your workflow today.